We all want the best of both. Dessert without calories, luxury without expense. And how about security without passwords? With Okta, it's possible. We secure identity so you can safely use any technology. Okta, the world's identity company. I'm Yasmin Gagne. I'm Josh Christensen. And this is Most Innovative Companies. On today's episode, Fast Company Editor-in-Chief Brendan Vaughn on our special cover feature about the 10 most innovative people in the last 10 years. I started to worry a little bit that, like Ryan Reynolds, is too everywhere. And by the time that he appears on our magazine, on our stage, that people will have had enough. And then Deadpool came out. Glossier CEO Kyle Leahy on the company's strong connection to fans. How lucky brands would be and how many brands would kill to have this many people wanting to have a conversation about your brand. And as always, keeping tabs. That is 10 separate places. I mean, yes, I subscribe to all of those, but still. (laughs) Sadly, I do too. (laughs) But first, here's the download. The news you need to know this week in the world of business and innovation. On Tuesday, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Trump had a heated debate. And who won? Swifties, because Taylor Swift (laughs) also endorsed Kamala Harris right after Mm -hmm. the debate. So a pretty big night for Kamala Harris, I would say. Mm -hmm. I also love the idea of, like, being an undecided voter. There are so few. And being like, oh, fuck, Taylor Swift endorsed this lady? Like... Yeah, it's the undecided voter thing is always baffling to me, especially mm-hmm. now in like these elections. Like the New York Times is like, we found two 18 year olds <laughs> like great. <laughs> but anyways, the two candidates had a debate. Trump was crazy. Kamala, by by all accounts, won the debate by most measures of people. What was missing from the debate was uh, any in-depth uh, talk about AI. It got mentioned a little bit, but not talked about a little bit. So not a not a big debate for the for the fast company crowd, but mm-hmm. a little more for the Inc. crowd. We had some small business talk over there for our sister publication. So go over to yeah. Inc. to read more about Kamala Harris's small business plan. Last month, the year-over-year consumer price index dropped to 2.5 percent from 2.9 percent in July. This is the lowest inflation has been since February 2021. However, one of the underlying factors, the cost of housing, is still high. The Federal Reserve has a policy meeting next week and is expected to announce quarter-point rate cut, though a large half-point rate cut is not off the table, in hopes of boosting a slowing job market. Our guy Jay Powell, let's get it. Jay Powell. (laughs) On Monday, Apple launched their new iPhone, the iPhone 16 and 16 Pro. I think I'm still on iPhone 13. I, I'm, my phone's, like, really falling apart I'm on right a, now. I think I'm on a 14. I actually thought I was on a 16, but that cannot be the case. So. No, clearly not. You know, unless you're from <laughs> the future, yes. Do you have something to admit to me? Yeah, 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 yeah. These new devices will come with Apple Intelligence, which is their version of a generative AI assistant. I'm assuming it's similar to at Google's Gemini at this point. The first version of this AI tool will arrive in a software update this fall. Apple also launched more products, including a slimmer version of Apple Watches, which everybody was asking for. It's too (laughs) too chunky on your wrist. They put it in that machine that crushed all the tools of human creativity in their ad. (laughs) (laughs) They also launched a new software update for AirPods that'll be good for the Apple AirPod 2 Pro that will allow them to perform as hearing aids. Meanwhile, both Apple and Google are facing big fines after both companies lost court battles. Google lost an appeal in the EU's top court about a 2.4 billion euro fine from the European Commission for breaking antitrust rules. Apple lost an appeal against an order from the European Court of Justice to repay 13 billion euros in back taxes to Ireland in a case about illegal government aid for corporations. Damn. Get your bag, Ireland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Europe is coming for you guys. <laughs> yeah, man, Europe is like John Wick and, Good. and Big Tech killed their dog. <laughs> right, next news story. I'm going to start with a little pun here. Turbulence at Boeing, get it? See what I did there? <laughs> is continuing this time with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. Union members voted down a tentative agreement with the company because it failed to reach the workers' original demand for a 40% wage increase over three years, offering only a 25% increase over that same time. 
They also wanted a restoration of traditional pensions, while Boeing only offered higher retirement contributions, a lump sum payment, and a commitment to building their next plane with union workers in Washington. Workers are now on strike, which is not great for a company with a huge backlog of planes to make and doors to fly off in the <laughs> midair. SpaceX has launched a billionaire into space to conduct the first private spacewalk. That is, the first spacewalk not done by a professional astronaut. Tech entrepreneur, he basically created a payments processor, which is pretty boring. Jared Isaacman. What is the job that you want to least hear first time done by a non-professional? I know. <laughs> like, it's surgery, like, this may be one of them. <laughs> Tech entrepreneur Jared Isaacman shared the cost of his trip with SpaceX, but wouldn't say how much he paid. The flight brings the crew into orbit far past the ISS and Hubble telescope to test SpaceX's new spacesuits. And that's the news you need to know today. So, Josh, if you had to be on any magazine list, what would it be? Well, I mean, I'm not very innovative, so I don't think I'd make <laughs> any of our... No chance. E- neither of us are making most innovative. Like, let's just be realistic here. But, yeah, I mean, you haven't heard my idea for a B2B SaaS company, so you don't really right. know, but, I'm like, sorry. it's also I apologize. It's very, it's I, very uninnovative. It's I need to go. At that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, oh, does being... <laughs> Man, I'm realizing I don't know. People Magazine's Most Beautiful People, People Magazine's Best Pets, GQ Men of the Year. Oh, Best Pets. Doing Best Pets. That's, that's but you the one can't, I But you, be you can't be on the Best Pets list. How about Maxim's Hot 100? <laughs> Maxim's Hot 100. Incredible answer. <laughs> that's a good one there. Um, I don't know. What's one where I just want to have, just give me lots of money so I can be on some like Forbes list. Right. Yeah. 40 under 40. Yeah, actually, that is legit like an earnest answer. The third, I've missed the boat on the 30 under 30 list, yeah. but I still have six years to be on those 40 under 40 lists. So that's kind of where I'd want to be. You'll have access to a network of all kinds of grifters. Yeah, exactly. My boy Tim Ferriss out here. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? What list would you would you want to be on? Uh, People Magazine's Most Beautiful People, Inside and Out. I, I you think, know uh, me. <laughs> or I think it would be really fun to be on like a worst dress list. Oh, yeah. That would be a fun one to be on. Yeah, I want to yeah, be on yeah. uh, Toward Best. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you could be like the worst the version. Worst one. It's me and Josh Gad and I'm the one who wore it worst. <laughs> the other one that cracks me up is in the UK. And I don't remember which publication is run through, but I believe it's run through publication. They have the annual Bad Sex Award and it's for... <laughs> bad sex scenes in books (laughs) like the worst writing about it oh my god that's terrific honestly writing about sex in books is so tragic overall no one yeah it is no the awards every year are so funny um (laughs) i would love to be nominated one day (laughs) <laughs> I, I do love that. So, well, short of us having uh, Fast Company's most innovative fan fiction list, I don't think we're going to have anything quite that we're tantalizing. Yeah. But Mm-mm. we do have a new list out uh, that was just announced this past Monday, and it's a big one. Yeah. So our latest cover is called the 10 Most Innovative People of the Last 10 Years. And we picked 10 people involved in business, running the gamut from entrepreneurs to big tech CEOs to celebrities to talk about their influence on culture. And joining us for the first time on the MIC podcast to talk about all this is Fast Company Editor-in-Chief Brendan Vaughn. Welcome to the show, Brendan. Thank you both for having me. I'm sorry it took me so long to get here, but I'm glad to be here. If this segment goes badly, we're not going to be on the air next week. It's basically the editor-in-chief's here, everybody. If this section goes badly, this will be my last appearance in the IC podcast. I will go back behind the scenes where I belong. This is the 10th year Fast Company has put on the Innovation Festival, and we're celebrating it with a special series. Tell us what inspired the series. So I was just trying to think of something um, that we could do to recognize the 10th anniversary of the Innovation Festival. Anniversaries are a magazine world staple. We Mm -hmm. love to celebrate our big moments. Really, we always have great speakers at the Innovation Festival. If you look back over the years, it's incredible the folks that have come. But to make this the 10 most innovative and use that device to both select a list, a really diverse list of people across industries, uh, use that framing to kind of have a great magazine package, great content on our website where we take a look and make an argument for the inclusion of these 10 people, but also 
uh, give them a good reason to speak at the Innovation Festival and have that group of 10 people form the kind of spine of the programming for the festival. They are by no means the only people that will be there, but they are going to be the sort of the center of the main stage. Probably the reason that you might want to come. Brendan, when's our Innovation Festival again? Yes, our Innovation (laughs) Festival uh, begins on Monday, uh, September 16th. That day is mostly our fast tracks, our field trips for grownups all around the city where our readers can come and go behind the scenes of the companies that we write about in Fast Company. Uh, and then the, main, the the stage programming at the forum stage and our workshops um, at uh, the Convene Hub, which is right by Zuccotti Park, One Liberty Plaza. That begins on Tuesday. So does the main stage programming at uh, the Tribeca Performing Arts Center at BMCC, uh, Borough of Manhattan Community College on Tuesday the 17th as well, running through Thursday. Never forget when I lost a group of 50 people in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, leaving them on a fast track oh, in 2018. No. Oh, my God. Nightmare. To put a button on that plug, I will say there is links to tickets. So look in the show notes if you still want to go to Innovation Festival. So what were the debates like? How did you make the choices for the 10 covers? I've actually got a copy of the magazine right here. This is actually our newsstand copy. So we have 11 magazine covers. Mm -hmm. Ten of them go to our subscribers, randomized, just being sent out randomly to all of our subscribers. Each one of these has one of the 10 people. And then for the newsstand, we did a cover that has all 10, and they are... Netflix co-CEO Ted Sarandos, Pat McGrath, CEO and founder of Pat McGrath Labs, Lena Khan, chair of the FTC, Ryan Reynolds, he doesn't even need a title, he's a million things. Yeah. (laughs) Guy. (laughs) Deadpool. Dude. Uh, Jennifer Doudna, who is a Nobel Prize winning biochemist and a pioneer of CRISPR gene editing technology. Jose Andres, the chef and founder of the World Central Kitchen. Sarah Nelson, who is the a renowned and very influential labor leader who uh, was a flight attendant and who runs the uh, Flight Attendants Union and is just kind of a beacon for the whole labor movement. Lin-Manuel Miranda, who wrote Hamilton. Josh's life crush. Yes. Should, do you need to step in here for a second? Uh, listen, I'll, well, we'll, get, we'll get to them. I'll, okay. I'll talk okay. about, right. I have gonna... a lot of thoughts around the innovation of Lin-Manuel Miranda in oh, the good. musical theater good. industry specifically. So nobody asked me to write the article for the magazine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where this is going, but I can't wait to get there. Um, last two, CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella and Issa Rae. Love Issa Rae. She was on our podcast. She is, she is terrific. Is there? I feel like there should be like a Pokemon type situation here with got to collect all of these covers from mm-hmm. the magazine. Buy uh, them. So buy them. Buy all of our magazines. I'm looking into our social There's camera. There's actually a winning lottery ticket in one of them. So if you buy a bunch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Uncle George and, and, and yeah. Uncle George, Aunt Georgina, uh, you know, you can take their ticket. Um, yeah, no. It would be hard to get all 10 because you'd have to be like a subscriber in 10 different places and just that randomly get them. But I'm now that I'm thinking about this, I'm it's possible. see if we can figure out a way. And it's hard to make a list that feels comprehensive across the whole business world yeah. and the culture world, which we cover in Fast Company as well, you know, with 10 people. I mean, that's kind of a tall order. Obviously, there's going to be people that absolutely belong mm-hmm. who aren't on this list. I invite people to argue about who is on this list. Yeah. That's a fun thing about Making lists is that, you know, the point of them is to recognize people, but also you just know that people are going to have feelings about it and some they're going to be supportive and, or they're going to be opposed and say, what in the world is this person doing on there? Bring it on. I love that stuff. Love to have those conversations. So there are some pretty famous people on this list. You know, we've talked about Ryan Reynolds, Issa Rae, but I want to talk about some of the names that may not be as well known. And let's start with Lena Khan, who you're actually interviewing on stage. Yes. So... Lena Khan is not like you wouldn't necessarily go like innovative when you think of Lena Khan, yeah. but when you really look at her work, I absolutely believe that she is. She's actually one of the most unusual and controversial antitrust thinkers in a very long time. And her tenure under Biden, who Joe Biden has been pretty aggressive against big tech, wanting to break up some of these companies, wanting to find ways to reduce the power of some of these companies and return some of that power to to individual Americans. So that's why he tapped Lena Khan to do this. Lena, when she was still a student, wrote a paper that was about Amazon. And it was a very different time back then uh, with Mm -hmm. Amazon. Amazon was in the stage when they were 
undercharging for everything in order to capture market Miss share. Miss that time. Yeah, Miss that, uh, time. that time is definitely no longer happening. But and to um, be clear, she was like a Yale law student. She, she was a like Yale a law high student. <laughs> yeah, no, this was she, 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 she would have been wild. Uh, she wasn't riding her tricycle down Bronx the street. Bronx science student. Bronx science yeah, yeah. student Lena Khan. She was obviously like a very um, serious thinker by this time, and 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 headed for a spectacular career that is now well underway. But her basic idea was that. We've always thought of antitrust as, does this make things more expensive for the consumer? Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the defining question forever about antitrust. And if things were, if the competition was not creating higher prices for the consumer, it was kind of like, okay, you guys are good. She totally reframed that and made it much more about all the other ways that monopolies and not very competitive business situations can affect workers, can affect consumers in other ways, can affect data privacy, like all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's that line, like, if it's free, you are the product, you know? And I think that Lena just came at it from this angle, and it did and still does piss off a lot of people who believe in, they just don't agree with her basic premise that this is anti-competitive. They believe Mm -hmm. that actually looking at it this way is going to reduce entrepreneurship, um, give brilliant, you know, entrepreneurs and startup geniuses less of motivation to start, you know, companies and try what, to create. they're like, oh, man, I can't build a monopoly now. Right. What else are you supposed to do when you drop out of Stanford? It's yeah. just, yeah. you don't have any options. So, you know, that's, th- that. that is kind of her, like, basic mm-hmm. framework for thinking about antitrust. And she's had some major successful lawsuits, right? She has had successes uh, with lawsuits involving NVIDIA um, the biotech firm Illumina. She has had some high-profile losses that people have been happy to kind of kind of pile on. Mm-hmm. Um, Meta, Microsoft. Um, the Microsoft case is pending appeal, but she lost in the most recent round, mm-hmm. and it's under appeal. So, yeah, she's had a mixed experience. You know, she's got a lot of huge fans and support from the left. Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders. Every Indian parent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And also some interesting support from across the aisle. Her ideas have created some unusual bedfellows. I mean, so J.D. Vance is a big fan of Lena Khan. Um, So is Josh Hawley, the senator from Missouri. Yeah, Matt Gates. I mean, so there's she's got the true freaks on her side. Yeah, I That's mean, she's, weird. Elizabeth Warren must be feeling real weird at those <laughs> cocktail parties. <laughs> it's definitely not typical. I mean, you know, you don't often find a, a public figure in public life who is admired by people as different as those two, and the reasons for that just have to do with uh, a growing belief on on the right that these tech companies are are, are dangerous uh, yeah. at, at the size that they're at, and particularly their ability to collect a lot of data and harvest a lot of data from consumers. Right. Yeah, they like billionaires, but have an issue with their companies. Right. To give our listeners some context, she was actually in the news this week because some Kamala Harris donors want her out, right? Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn and a board member of Microsoft that, as we just mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, has been in a legal battle with the FTC and Lena. He told CNN that I hope that if Kamala Harris wins, she will replace Lena Khan uh, as right. FTC chair. He is not a fan. And uh, there's been more recent reporting, all of it anonymous, it should be noted, at least mm-hmm. as far as I can tell. I haven't seen any names attached to any of this, but there's this idea that lots of um, big Kamala Harris donors would like to see her replaced as well. Like I don't know what their reasons are because I don't know who they are and mm-hmm. none of it has really been on the record. So we should be careful about that. But I think we can probably safely assume that the reasons are similar to the reasons that Reed Hoffman and Barry Diller called her a dope, you know, like which is just <laughs> real, mature, real mature, Barry. <laughs> it's all over the political spectrum and you have lots of different both supporting her and opposing her. So last year, fewer than half of U.S. households subscribed to traditional cable and satellite services, in part because of Netflix. Tell us what co-CEO Ted Sarandos has to say about where the company's headed. Netflix is kind of headed everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's Netflix's model right there. They're all over the world. They get criticized for this. You see lots of culture critics talking about, like, it's all garbage. Have either of you seen the new Nicole Kidman show on Netflix? I have seen this, yes. Worst thing I've ever watched. I just really badly want a second season now. (laughs) My God. Anyway, Ted Sarandos. Uh, So Ted, who I'm interviewing on stage also Mm -hmm. at the Innovation Festival, is a real, I don't want to say old-fashioned because his his thinking is pretty modern and he's really, you know, he's not, he's one person. He's the co-CEO with Greg Peters. So they have a, like a power sharing arrangement that seems to work fairly well for them. 
Well, Bella Bajaria is the head of content and Ted handles like publicity and he does lots of kind of diplomacy. He travels the world. He talks to lots of people in the creative community. He's very good with them. He is a strategy person. He is exceptional at timing. Mm -hmm. Ted was involved with deciding when to begin to make original programming. Wow. You know, Netflix has, has had a bunch of moments over the years, not all of which involved Ted Sarandos, but they've been good at figuring out like, when does streaming become feasible for a large enough people that it makes sense to kind of depreciate and downplay the DVD by mail, original business, switch over to streaming? When does it make sense to stop licensing all of your content and start making your own? When does it make sense to start putting advertising on the network? The advertising part, by the way, jury's very much out on that. They're actually struggling with advertising. They've lost a couple of key executives. And Wall Street loves Netflix in general. Not always, but like lately yeah. for sure. But they don't love the pace of the advertising tier that Roll they've up. added. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are actually subscribing to it, but they're not bringing in an enormous amount of actual revenue yet. But so, you know, Ted has been, he's this kind of slightly old-timey, backslappy studio head kind of mm -hmm. guy. And he's very charming, and he's, like, he's very good with creators. And, you know, he does have this, like, clearly a pretty good sense of when to make these, like, big bets that, by and large, not everyone for sure, but by and large, you know, have, have paid off. He's been there for a long time, grew up in Arizona. Just an interesting character that we chose to kind of devote, like, the most space to in this issue with a big story on him. And he's responsible for a pretty particular company culture, I would say, right, where executives are encouraged to sort of air out their mistakes all the time. Netflix has this famous culture doc. Yeah. Which is, the I'm, I'm forgetting, it's not called the culture doc. It's called the culture something. Manifesto. It's a very tech world thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Netflix was, um, before they had the LA operation, they were a Bay Area company. It has much more in common with San Francisco style tech companies than it does with LA studios. Beyond the tech world, I want to talk a little bit about Sarah Nelson, who you mentioned earlier. Always has great hair whenever I see her, but there is more to her. Than that's that. what the innovation's yeah. about, that's really. That's what the innovation is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she was on our cover a while ago. Morgan Clen Daniel wrote a really good story. Tell us about why she merited inclusion on this list. So, Sarah Nelson has really sort of, she is a representative of an idea. Yeah. She, she yeah. is a very powerful representative of an idea. She is not the first person in the labor movement to take a adversarial stance right. with management, of course. But that idea had sort of faded a little bit. And there was more, I'm not a, a student of the history of the labor movement, but I do know that like in the auto industry, the unions were perceived to have gotten way too cozy with management yeah. over time, you know, mm -hmm. and then Sean Fain, who is a similar figure to Sarah Nelson, was like, nope, we're not doing it that way. We're going to kind of be mm -hmm. pretty, you know, respectful, but still like tough. She's a good storyteller and mm -hmm. she is good at creating a narrative that, while maybe arguably reductive in some sense, is just clear. It's like you have the corporate elite and you have the working class, yeah. you know, and you have these two groups and they're sort of in like a holy war against each other for fairness and for kind of who deserves what at the end of the day. She's an exceptional communicator. She is very, very good at strategy and tactics and just getting her point across. And she has been inspirational to um, lots of other labor leaders, including Sean Fain. She remains very active. She is working on deals, just trying to get Delta, which is the last airline uh, that doesn't have a union to unionize. She has won recent battles uh, for her members in Alaska Airlines. She got them a 32% 30, 32 raise. 32% raise. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's a huge raise and, you know, huge triumph for her, American Airlines. So she still is focused on her industry, but her impact and her influence is significantly wider than that. So she's on the list because she has just had a vision for how to do this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one thing that we tried to make sure that all of our, the people that we included on this list do is that they had to have made a huge impact in their world, but they also had to have had broader impact and like, right. had that in the innovation at the heart of whatever it is that they do kind of spill out more widely. Let's talk about Jose Andres. Tell us why he's on our cover. So I think that Jose Andres is a really, really successful chef, business person who, you know, developed this chain of chains, not the word. He developed a, a lot of restaurants, uh, Spanish restaurants in Washington, D.C., 
One of them, mini bars, two Michelin stars. He's a very acclaimed chef. He's part of Mercado, yes. Little Spain in New York. Yep. Yeah. So he his I mean, he's got restaurants all over the world. DC was kind of where it began, but yeah, it's expanded around the world. There's a lot of chefs that have developed restaurants, but Jose Andres would not have been on this list if he hadn't done the other huge thing that he has done in recent years, which is... Introduce Americans to jamón ibérico. <laughs> <laughs> not that, but I, I love I love a jamón ibérico. What's the one they like? They're like, these hams only eat like certain acorns on like alternate Tuesdays or whatever. And, you here. Know, yeah, right. No, yeah. <laughs> Josh, please. Uh, for, if I know one thing, it's ham. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hamon. <laughs> yes. He's a big ham advocate. But <laughs> the thing that he did that is so unique is created this thing called World Central Kitchen. And World Central Kitchen is an organization that basically sends food to crisis zones around the Mm -hmm. world. And he's done it in Haiti. He's done it uh, in Gaza, Ukraine. He was in the news this year because seven of his workers were killed in Israeli airstrike in Gaza while trying to deliver aid to people there. And he sends chefs there, too. You know, it's not just sending food. It's like sending a group on the ground to cook and help out. Yeah, it's a, he's got staffers, but he's also got lots of volunteers. He likes to say a lot that all you have to do is kind of show up there and everybody wants to pitch in and help. I think a lot of the people on the list have sort of one thing in common, which is this sort of like simple, clarifying like mission that mm-hmm. they just constantly seem to remind themselves about. And I think with Jose Andres, it's just everybody's got to eat. We are chefs. We can get the food there. There's food everywhere. There's food in warehouses. Like kind of no matter how bad things are, there's food. A lot of it is just logistics. And if you can get the logistics worked out, you can get the food in front of the people that. So for those who didn't catch Margella's Haute Couture show, I'm saying that like everybody caught it. <laughs> who is Pat McGrath? Why was she in the news? Why is she the most influential makeup artist in the world? This is the one that I, I will admit I knew the least about when we started this. But I've, I've come to understand that Pat McGrath is this sort of like... People call her mother. Yeah. She just brought this enormous level of creativity to something that I guess was always more, less about thinking of the face as like an artistic palette. Yeah, yeah. And more like just the, you know, really high quality makeup that kind of does the thing that makeup has always done. And she's just, she just doesn't think about it that way. Like she did this thing. And I mean, I'm saying this like I'm like discovering this. I'm not at all. There's like, (laughs) you know, people that are into this. This is like incredibly old news. But like, you know, this glass um, face thing Mm -hmm. that she did inspired by like porcelain dolls. And she created a makeup system, I guess, that basically makes your face look like it's kind of made of glass. And she's coming out with a product um, for that. And she brought something really unique to the list. She's like a dame of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. You know, she's just like a beloved person who has uh, accomplished this like level of notoriety in a world that just wasn't really kind of known for producing that kind of person before. Totally. She was doing this before, you know, makeup on social media became such a big industry. She was sort of the first person to sell her makeup or a product direct to consumer. And she has the ability to work with designers to translate their vision into makeup. It's like an ability to complement their art and create art in and of itself. So Satya Nadella was already a recent cover subject. He's the CEO of Microsoft. Why did he make it on the list this year? I think I know. Yeah, I mean, Satya Nadella has taken Microsoft, which was a company that, I mean, people had just kind of written it off 10 years ago. Yeah. Not that, I mean, there was still Microsoft Word and the whole office suite installed on a gajillion computers all over the world. It's not like the... Justin bi- Long, uh, John Hodgman commercials. Yes. Just kind of put that nail in the coffin. <laughs> For those of you who don't remember that, these were these Apple commercials where there was the cool actor and the nerd actor. The nerd was Microsoft. The cool actor was Apple. And that summed it up. Great, mm-hmm. great reference. I mean, that that was basically what everyone thought about Microsoft, yeah. which is that, sure, like, I'm not going to, like, stop using it, but, man, it is it is dreary stuff. And um, Satya, you know, not all at once, mm-hmm. uh, you know, made a big bet on reorienting the company toward AI some years ago, did this pretty smart deal with OpenAI where they got, you know, they had a unique and privileged partnership with OpenAI, so made a big bet there, and, you know, was just right at the forefront of the kind of generative AI revolution that didn't begin in November 2022, but became known to the world in November 2022 when ChatGPT came out, and has just had this first mover advantage that has kept Microsoft at the forefront 
in ways that just even people like Harry McCracken, who wrote that story, that cover story that we ran in September of 2023 about um, Satya Nadella, you know, would not have... uh, My point is that even the most, like, you know, in the know tech journalists and other tech insiders just would not, I think, have predicted that Microsoft's relevance and just kind of heat in 2023, 2024 and beyond would would be what it is. But his first decade as CEO wasn't totally without disappointments, right? There has certainly been swings that, that Satya has made that have been whiffs, but he has had this big success. And, you know, they passed the $3 trillion in market cap this year. Yeah, my dad used to work for Microsoft. So I think of Satya as the guy who lets my parents pay their mortgage. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks, Uncle Satya. Yeah, thanks, Uncle Satya. <laughs> Josh, can you tell me what CRISPR is off the top of your head? CRISPR is a gene editing. Um, it's a, oh, well, it's um, it's an organic, it basically was a discovery. It's an organic thing. I can't remember the exact <laughs> Sorry, terminology. I'm just trying to put you on the this. spot. <laughs> no, but that actually I is what tell it you. Is. I couldn't it, tell it, you. It, like, it I know it's genes related. It's basically it's discovered this. It's not an amino acid. I'm coming off the wrong scientific terms. You but watch it, too much hair care commercials. That's well, how you know what an amino acid is. Yeah, no, it's, I do know things. I listen to Radio Lab. <laughs> I mean, I don't know the words. Mitochondria. (laughs) What what are we doing here? (laughs) How do you not remember what a clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeat is? Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, Jennifer uh, Doudna is a uh, obviously a scientific genius, to state the very obvious. Her work has had a huge impact and is now being commercialized in ways that are going to help with diseases that range from sickle cell to diagnostics for the Zika virus, disease models for Alzheimer's, therapeutics capable of attacking cancer cells. There's there's a lot that you can do with this technology. And uh, she and her partner, whose name is Emmanuel Charpentier, they sort of first published this paper in Science 12 years ago, but then won the Nobel in, in 2020. And um, she has an organization called the Innovative Genomics Institute, and she works, she has a lab at, at Berkeley. She's another one whose work just has massive, massive impact beyond the things that she personally is going to do with it. Tell you, I totally forgot about Zika. Yeah. Yeah, that's TBT. throwback. Yeah. That's throw, throw throwback, throwback Thursday. disease. Yeah. Zika is your TBT throwback Zika. Thursday. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the celebrities. Our listeners have heard from Ryan Reynolds if they listen to any podcast ever. But, Watch uh, TV at any point. That guy is everywhere. Ryan Reynolds is everywhere. I, I will confess that kind of in the final month or so of us, like, putting this this whole issue and this package together, I started to worry a little bit that, like, Ryan Reynolds is too everywhere. <laughs> and by the time that he appears on our magazine and on our stage, that people will have had enough of Ryan Reynolds for a minute. And then Deadpool came out, and it was unbelievably gangbusters and successful. Mm-hmm. And clearly, if there's fatigue, it's, it's not everywhere. Certainly you know, your favorite movie that came out this year. I haven't <laughs> seen it yet, but I'm going to see it. But, yeah, no, I mean, Ryan is, is not really just in Fast Company, of course, because he's a a movie person. He's there because of his advertising work, his brand work. He's really been pretty creative about just doing advertising in ways that are really like irreverent and casual almost. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Some of the stuff that he's done through his companies like Aviation Gin and his work for Mint Mobile um, and, you know, just the advertising maximum effort is his uh, his ad firm. And the philosophy tone is, is really the right word, I think, for the work has been successful for him and his partners, but also has kind of permeated out throughout you know, much more broadly. Yeah, one thing I'll give him credit for is he has so much self-awareness baked into all his ads. Like, it's almost like he's turning at you and being like, you're watching an ad anyway. But that's kind of always been his brand. I mean, that's obviously very much Deadpool's brand, but that's always kind of been Ryan Reynolds' brand. Which Not Van I- Wilder days. <laughs> Van Wilder, <laughs> write that down. Um, <laughs> no, but there's always been a self-awareness to him, and it's it makes sense that he's honed that and leaned into that. It's like, it's we talk about this a lot, like your brand is not separate from your business, and I think he gets that better than most. Absolutely. I feel like he just kind of, I, I don't want to say it's easy. I'm sure he works hard, but like it, it it's all very consistent. Yeah. Josh, 
Why should we talk about Lin-Manuel right now? Well, obviously you should read Jill Bernstein's piece and come and hear him talk. But for me, as a musical theater kid, uh, if people don't know, I'm bringing big theater kid (laughs) energy to this podcast all the time. But Lin-Manuel Miranda has changed the way that theater is done on Broadway. Absolutely. And it's not just with Hamilton, although that's his biggest success. His first show, In the Heights, came out in 2008. And this is kind of what I think is amazing. That show recouped in 10 months. Wow. It came out in the spring of 2008. So through the economic crash, yeah. it recouped a $10 million investment in 10 months on Broadway and then ran for another three years. That That's is incredible. Incredible. It's unheard of. And he's also changed the sound. Like, there's basically, when you think about Disney music now, you now think of Lin-Manuel Miranda the same way you think of Alan Mankin from Yaz and I's childhood, the same way you think to a lesser extent, like, Robert Lopez and, and Kristen Anderson Lopez, who wrote... <laughs> totally know who those they people They wrote are. Frozen. They, they're okay. the right songwriters behind mm-hmm. Let It Go. But those are basically the names you think about. So, like, it's really hard to understate the kind of creative impact Lin-Manuel Miranda has had, but it's also kind of, like, changed the way that investors on Broadway think about shows that can be successful. Yes, because of Hamilton, but I think even more so because of In the Heights. That's a hot take. In in, in the Heights yeah. more than Hamilton. Like I, In the Heights Josh is more innovative than Hamilton. Wow. Would you know literally anything about Alexander Hamilton <laughs> without that musical? No, that is true. <laughs> I mean, in terms of innovating our our understanding of the Federalist Papers, yeah, <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that to me, I don't. I'm not going to argue with you because you definitely know what you're talking about here. And I like <laughs> I saw it in the Heights and, and enjoyed it very much. But to me, the thing that just no matter how many times you think about Hamilton, it does not get any less crazy. Just the basic idea. You know, yeah, the basic it sounds like idea. one of my bad pitches. It's it's <laughs> wild. Hamilton started as a concept album. He's doing the same development yeah. method for The Warriors. The, uh, it's based on the 1979 film, his new uh, project coming out. Right. A really smart way to develop new shows because developing, like you said, many, many years to develop musicals, you don't see a penny of the like recruitment and often never until you get to Broadway. And that could be years, decades after conception of a show. Doing it as a cast album, uh, do basically creating a cast album or a concept album first is cheaper, develops an audience right away, and it probably fast tracks you a little bit more. Not that Lin Manuel Miranda needs any help with that now, but it's really smart. Yeah. I agree that he's really innovative. His one misstep trying to take on Dick Van Dyke's iconic role from Mary Poppins. Mm. Oof, yeah, let's not talk about Mary Poppins, too. That was rough. (laughs) (laughs) Oi, I am a chimney sweep. It's like Lynn. Somehow a doing? worse Cockney accent than Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, even the 10 most innovative people of the last 10 years swing and miss times, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we're saving this podcast favorite for last, Issa Rae. She gained mainstream popularity for show Insecure, but she's won a Peabody Award. She's done a lot of other stuff. Why did you want to include her on the list? You know, Issa Rae is just somebody that is so fully committed to supporting actors, Mm -hmm. creators, writers, directors of color, and she has really built her whole career around it. Things kind of began with The Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl, which was that YouTube um, series that she wrote. She kind of got the money from the internet. She starred in it. She, you know, really connected with Black Millennials for the show's timeliness and authenticity. And she just became sort of emblematic of this new kind of creator, uh, of which there have been many, many, many since then, DIY, underrepresented, and just kind of did it herself. She made Insecure for HBO. She built on this kind of broader mission with uh, Hooray. I don't know if I'm saying that right. The Mm -hmm. company that she founded in 2020 that has TV and film, has a talent management division, marketing, music, all built around creating opportunities for people of color. So she's just really committed to creating opportunities, and she's very focused when you talk to her about this. I mean, she really is sort of unapologetic and very clear about what her objective is. And it's a very repeatable kind of philosophy that she's able to apply across a lot of different like areas of her business activity. She's also our uh, our nation's first black woman president in the Barbie movie. That is oh, true. Indeed <laughs> she is, yes. We love you, Lisa. <laughs> yep. We'll be back with Brendan for keeping tabs, but first, a quick break followed by my interview with Glossier CEO Kyle Leahy. Thank you. 
We all want the best of both. Dessert without calories, luxury without expense, and how about security without passwords? With Okta, it's possible. We secure identity for your business, so you can safely use any technology. You can build experiences that are richer and more secure, grow revenue without running up costs, and scale easily, no matter your tech stack. Enjoying the best of both? It's possible. It's Okta. Okta, the world's identity company. Kyle Leahy has been the CEO of Glossier since 2022. She took over from its very prominent founder, Emily Weiss. Now, to me, the brand will always be closely linked to millennials, and I'm a millennial, so that's no shade there. The company's always had this kind of light, minimal aesthetic. It has never promoted having a full face of foundation and concealer. It's always been about sort of like natural beauty, or as a friend of mine described it, you need to already have nice skin and then look kind of wet. Their first products launched when I was in my early 20s, and I remember buying the Face Mist, Skin Tint, and Best Selling Balm at the time. Ten years later, though, with so many millennials in their 30s, like me, I wanted to know how Kyle thinks about Glossier growing up alongside its customers. I think we are building a forever brand and that we're on year 10 of building yeah. a 100-year brand. And I think brands that have that longevity and resilience connect multi-generational because they're actually not connecting with just one demographic. They're mm-hmm. connecting on a psychographic. They connect with a mindset and they connect on a values basis and a deep emotional basis. And Glossy, I think, has tapped into that in a way that I think very few brands in any category have done to that level in the last decade. To me, that's why people uh, wear the sweatshirt of a beauty brand yeah. Uh, yeah. or they they line up for hours outside of a store opening is, yes, for the products and experiences and the joy that we create, but more so because they want to be part of something bigger. And I think that ethos allows you and gives you the runway to connect across generations. So we see that in that we obviously grew up as a millennial brand. Yeah. And we continue to have a big contingent of our our consumer base, which is millennial, but we have now kind of jumped and continue to resonate with uh, Gen Z and increasingly Gen Alpha. And we see that in things like our social platform. So Instagram, we continue to see really healthy um, growth. Even a lot of people see that platform declining for us. It's still a really important brand platform for us. And we continue to see significant growth there. We just passed 3.1 million community members on Instagram. But yet on a platform like TikTok, we've seen exponential growth where we've gone from about a billion views on hashtag Glossier to now uh, about 3 billion since we launched at Sephora. So to me, we're seeing like how the generational trends are coming to life. Are we where our customer is? Are we in the conversation? Yeah. Are we on the platforms that they're engaging with beauty on? And are we leading the conversation in that and participating in it with, with our customers? That allows us to connect with now millennials, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, And then we see this fun, like, mother-daughter shopping dynamic. So for us, it's really about the whole picture and how we kind of grow with people and stay across generations. How do you think about kind of updating your branding as it grows up? And I'll I'll give you an example of this, right? Glossier, I always associate with millennial pink. It's still the color of your stores. At the same time, I remember the latest bomb.com campaign had, like, these pixelated pictures. And for the first time, I was like, I feel old because this does not resonate with me. (laughs) Like, how do you think about keeping your early customers there and bringing in new ones? I think for any great brand, so much of it is is how do you stay true to your core DNA and yeah. understanding why do people come to us? Do they yeah. come to us because yeah. we're DSC? Do they come to us for our technology? No, they come to us because they're a beauty brand they want to be mm-hmm. a part of. And so for us, that is like, how do we tap into and keep consistency of that brand, but also modernize it and move forward? One of the things that we do exceptionally well at Glossier that has always kept Glossier at the forefront is that we move at the speed of culture. Mm-hmm. We are leading the conversation. We're in the zeitgeist, whether that's through people that we've partnered with and that we kind of bring into the conversation conversation, whether that's through our strategic partnerships like the WMBA or the way that we do our social impact work or the way that we're thinking about how we're doing our campaigns or go to market. I think Glossier's millennial pink, largely millennial pink was because of Glossier and because Mm -hmm. of how important this brand has been to the last decade. Uh, We like to call it Glossier Pink because I think it is is actually not about a generation. It's about actually our brand. And some of those things are really core. And I think our intentionality, our attention to detail, you know, our product design, the naming, the little nods, like the smile way that you see yeah. on our packaging or the really thoughtful details, like an extra click that you'll get in, mm-hmm. in one of our packaging designs, all of which we do in-house, all of which is is a huge part of uh, what makes our brand so special. 
So I want to talk about how you've transformed the business. Last year, Glossier started a partnership with Sephora, and earlier this year, you announced that it would enter another retail chain in the UK with retailer Space NK. What was your thinking around that? Yeah, I mean, I think Glossier was so revolutionary a decade ago when it was founded on several fronts. I mean, I think being a community-driven brand, the notion of come as you are and beauty in everyday life. I think it was also very disruptive in the D2C business model. I think Glossy was really at the forefront of bringing beauty online and showing that you could really tell and transition from editorial and a social platform and social content into a commerce experience. Even a fragrance, for instance, to be able to sell a perfume and have a perfume like we have um, now the number one mm-hmm. perfume in, in Sephora and fragrance, to have built that online is incredible. And D to C is not our value proposition. Our community, our customers don't come to Glossy because we're D to C. Brands endure, but channels evolve and mm-hmm. customers evolve. And so it was important that we evolved with our customer and to go where she is and to say, let's bring beauty to where she is shopping for beauty and mm-hmm. let's meet her there um, and do it in a way that's uniquely Glossier and do it in a way that actually is building on the amazing 10 years that we have on D2C history. You know, when Glossier came out, I think it's branding and it's value proposition of being very like, you know, no makeup, makeup. You don't need to like look totally different. Seemed really fresh and new. I think there's a lot of brands that have come up that are similar. How do you think about competing with those brands? I think that's to me where we have uh, a size and scale of deep emotional connection with our consumer and where the brand comes in. We were built from the beginning as a multi-ax brand. So makeup, skincare, fragrance, body, merch. And that puts us almost transcendent to beauty as a lifestyle brand. The fact that people wear the sweatshirt of a beauty brand or line up around the block for our store openings, I think really is a testament that people are connecting on a much deeper level with this brand. I think our community engagement is much deeper. I think the longevity of this brand shows that this brand is going to be here for decades rather than just be kind of of the moment, tapping into a makeup trend. How do you think about expanding into different categories? I think a lot of brands are wondering if they have permission to play and move into new categories. We've demonstrated that Glossier has permission to play. The consumer engages with us across those categories, and that gives us incredible runway for growth. Fragrance is one of the most exciting parts of our business. And I think one of the the least maybe known aspects of Glossier's portfolio, which is Glossier U, which was launched in 2017, so has been um, now on the market almost seven years. And um, it's designed uh, and built, and the fragrance is constructed to be intentionally missing its top note. So Mm -hmm. it smells a little different on everyone. Uh, It's named Glossier U. The bottle has that beautiful thumbprint. When you think culturally and what we're seeing in trend for the next generations around how they think about fragrance, I think fragrance is really going to increasing and is showing that is a sign of individuality sign of your identity, uh, the way people are layering fragrances, the way the end. And I think Glossy U is perfectly positioned. So it's not by accident that it's the number one fragrance in Sephora. We used to sell a bottle every 40 seconds. Now it's every 20 seconds. And we're continuing to see this exponential growth in fragrance. And I think it's because it's positioning the fragrance, the way it's built is all connected again to those like values-based trends. Something that's been fun to see, and Glossy has been doing this for years, is it engages with fan content online and almost uses it in its marketing. Tell me about how, as a company, you all cultivate that community and also take advantage of it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so core to the roots of Glossier. We were born of, by, and for the community. Into the Gloss, um, the blog that Emily wrote that preceded even the founding of Glossier is is very much at our roots. It's still an important part of our brand, actually, mm-hmm. the, the blog Into the Gloss. I'm so uh, glad have... you guys picked it up because for a while it was dead. <laughs> It's a really important yeah. part of um, of our storytelling. And, you know, ultimately, we believe in how we're giving everyone a voice through beauty. And we do that very tied to our editorial roots. And how do we tell people's stories? And so you're only going to continue to see more of that from us. Um, so our community is an, a very important part, really active in product creation, whether it was a Slack channel in the early mm-hmm. days or giving input or the way that we listen to our social community and feedback on platforms like Instagram and TikTok or our Reddit community, which is yeah. now more than 50,000 yeah. strong, uh, a very active and dynamic. The Reddit community is insane. <laughs> it's, it's real, real. Um, and it's, I think brands, they're up, you know, you can't always make everyone happy and you always have to think about how do I harness the yeah. power of a community? Uh, not everyone will always agree, but uh, I often you know, say to our teams, like the, how lucky brands would be and how many brands would kill to have this many people wanting to have a conversation about your brand. 
good, bad, and ugly. We take all of that, and and it's a, an incredible part of our superpower is that we we do listen very actively to the good and the bad, and we take it into our product strategy. We take uh, suggestions and ideas into our product roadmap. We take it into our go to market. Uh, one of our core iconic hero products is Bomb.com, and we reformulated that and heard pretty loud and clear from our community that <laughs> the product didn't uphold the standard that we wanted to put on the market and. We said the right thing to do was to go back to the original formula. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of time and yeah. a lot of energy. And then we really partnered with the community and and from everything from sending some of our most vocal community members some product, a hand delivered by Emily. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, like really one-to-one -one engagement to doing, you may have seen our kind of mean tweets inspired, <laughs> <Yeah>. um, Jimmy <laughs> Kimmel inspired. Am I reading the first thing that's on here? I hate newbomb.com. I am on my hands and knees begging you to bring back the original formula. Y'all would do anything but bring back the original bomb.com. We're here to have fun. It's a beauty brand. Yeah. Uh, we bring joy. I know you all um, expanded to Australia. Congratulations. How do you think about territorial expansion? When I joined, there were really three clear messages that we heard from our community. One mm -hmm. was, uh, we want more product, and mm -hmm. we want you to continue to innovate and bring product to market. Um, the second was, when are you going to be in Sephora or yeah. Ulta or at retail? <laughs> and the third is, when are you expanding internationally? So we we have incredible consumer demand internationally. More than mm -hmm. half of our uh, community uh, Instagram and social following is outside the U.S., mm -hmm. yet 98% of our business is still in the U.S. and the U.K. We just launched international shipping this fall. So it's been a long time coming and we are at the very, very early innings of international expansion. So now it's around how do we bring more glossy to more people around the world? And Australia is a good example of a, kind of a next market we could enter. We entered with our partner and the Mecca launch was, was incredible. And to see you know, for a decade, consumers have been waiting for Glossier in Australia, lined up around the block at the flagship opening to the excitement online to just that kind of fervor and excitement and um, really excited about what it continues to mean for the long-term opportunity for Glossé to expand internationally. I want to talk a little bit about partnerships now, WNBA being the biggest one, which I want to hear about. But you've also partnered with specific sort of influencers like Sophia Richie had a collection. I think Olivia Rodrigo had one. I'm curious how you think about partnerships and which ones you think kind of makes sense for the brand. Yeah, I mean, I think for us, we have always been, I think, tied to our community roots. Glossier is a people-powered ecosystem. We aim to tell the depth of that story. So um, the WMBA, as an example, has been a partnership that we have had since 2020. So we were mm -hmm. the first beauty brand to partner with the WMBA, um, maybe before all the fervor started. And yeah. I think... I think it's a great example of how Glossier has been at the forefront and has led in culture and really said, we are going to step out and partner with the W as an example of um, where we can really uphold our values and celebrate these incredible women who we mm -hmm. think represent beauty in everyday life and have a lot of um, room to go on making it an equitable world um, in the world of women's sports. These women are entrepreneurs, they're mothers, they're incredible athletes. They're often having to juggle all of those things because they certainly aren't making a salary as a, as a professional yeah, basketball yeah. player to support very unlike the, their male mm -hmm. counterparts. So we felt it was important to tell those stories. And I think that's kind of how we've always thought about partnerships, moving at the speed of culture, being ahead of the curve, partnering with people, with organizations that represent our values. Uh, that's true to the every one of our stores. We have a local charitable organization that we partner with, that we have a merch item only available in that store that we donate um, back to the local community. So for us, it's very values driven. It's very authentic and it has to really align with what we stand for as a brand. And then we continue to build upon it and bring those partnerships to life over time. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. I guess my last question for you, and I ask this to a lot of founders, and I'm always surprised by the answer, is what company is your North Star? Everybody says Patagonia. I've had a few bad answers. One person said Wikipedia, and I was like, not a company. And then they went out of business. And I was like, well, <laughs> I was like, that's not profit. <laughs> I mean, I think there isn't a mo like there isn't a model to, for Glossier that I would say that there is. We're not building Glossier to be like any other company. I right, think it takes it like bits and pieces from I think the intentionality and design aesthetic of an Apple to the emotional connection you get from a, a values-based brand like Nike to the mm -hmm. to the um, 
you know, values-based positioning you do get from maybe a Patagonia and otherwise to the design and the lux- everyday luxury feeling that you might get from a Chanel. And to us, mm-hmm. it, is, it is kind of how we tap into those different dynamics to make a brand that actually is the one that I think a lot more people are pointing to. I want to make a, a brand like Glossier. And for us, it is um, about kind of taking everything that we've seen in brand, in brand and in culture and also then disrupting the playbook and moving that forward and trying to create something totally new, which there isn't a playbook for. Mm-hmm. And I think that is what we're doing in beauty. I don't think there's a brand that looks quite like Glossier in beauty and beyond. And we're really proud and excited about building this brand for the next decade that will continue to lead the way. And what's your favorite Glossier product? Oh. Future do, I think. It is kind of Glossier in a bottle. I've never Um, used that. I thought about buying it, but I never pulled the trigger on it. Because I don't know how to that use glowy. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are three days that you can wear it. You can wear it as a little bit of a highlighter or as a primer. So for me, it feels like glossy in the bottle. It represents, it is one of like our most iconic products that has lasted for years and really kind of represents our skin first, makeup second ethos. I think otherwise, uh, I'd have to say glossy at you for mm-hmm. the reasons that I described. Um, and I think that it really um, taps into uh, what's happening in fragrance at a really deep cultural and generational level that I think is really exciting. And so I wear that uh, every day. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Kyle, for coming on the show. Of course. I loved it. We are back with Brendan, and it's time to wrap up the show with Keeping Tabs. This is where each one of us shares a story, trend, or piece of pop culture we're following right now. And Brendan, since you're our guest, what are you keeping tabs on? So at the risk of just seeming like the most obvious answer of all time, I am keeping tabs on the NFL, Mm -hmm. but I am not keeping tabs on the games, although I like the games. I am keeping tabs on the insane media broadcast, kind of like just (laughs) tangential content ecosystem of the Mm -hmm. NFL, which has just reached some kind of critical mass. I mean, it's been building for a long time. The NFL wants to kind of eat the world. Games in like Brazil the other day, like multiple games in London and all that stuff that's been building. But like what happened just this year, like in the last week or two as the season has started, really just just that we're in the first week, is like you have to, to watch all the games. You have to have Amazon, Peacock, Netflix, YouTube, NBC, Fox, CBS, ABC, of course, ESPN, and the NFL Network, if you want to watch every NFL game. That is 10 That's separate nuts. places. I mean, yes, to I watch subscribe football. to all of those, but <laughs> <Yeah>. still. <laughs> Sadly, I do, too. Um, but we're, like, media dorks. I yeah, mean, I think yeah. we subscribe to the all. Like, the average just, like, football fan out there, I don't think there is a limit to how badly people want to watch the NFL. And it's sad to say, but there probably is no limit. They probably are not going to reach the limit with this. They probably actually have even farther to go. I gave up a long time ago on thinking that anybody would ever like bail on the NFL. Like after like the CTE thing where everyone's like, oh my God, the NFL is going to become like NASCAR. The NFL is going to become like boxing or something. Yeah, totally. Like that is gone. That is just not going to happen. Everybody is as obsessed as ever, if not more. And then on top of this, like really kind of mind blowing number of places that show games is like Tom Brady and Belichick are now like in the broadcast booth. You have this like changing of the guard. Bill Belichick's doing like seven different shows at this point. Like he's on McAfee, he's on Manning Cast, he's on all these different networks. Didn't somebody criticize Tom Brady's on-air performance and had to issue like an official apology? This is the New York Times today. Oh, really? I'm (laughs) sure they did. That sounds (laughs) about right. I'm dying to know who who that was. You have to send me that because I will, I'll find it. a lot of people criticized Tom Brady's performance in his first game. Now it's his first game. Yeah. He will presumably get better, but he was not good. Red Zone host Scott Hansen. Oh, yeah. yeah that guy will get some. Yeah. If you're in under the sway of the NFL, yeah, you're going to get some heat for saying that. But like if you get paid effectively yeah. by the NFL, you're going to get some heat for saying that. But no one thought Tom Brady was good in his first um, game, and uh, I will say he it's was, hard. You he know? was it, funny on the Manning cast. Like, last year when he appeared, I was like, oh, who knew this guy had a personality? Not I. He is definitely emerging as a different type of person that we all thought he yeah. was. Yeah. So, like, even, like, in the uh, the Dynasty, which was the Patriots docuseries, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. he, he came across in that as kind of, like, almost, like, more sweet and vulnerable and, like, Less AI generated. Craving (laughs) Bill Belichick's (laughs) approval and always the underdog. No one thinks I'm good enough. I'm going to prove you wrong. And then, like, when he did this 
thing at the end of the roast on Netflix. Yes. Unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, he was that like. That really made funny. me so uncomfortable because I was just like, this is just a gathering of people who bullied me in high school. <laughs> 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 totally. And they're all sitting up there on stage and some of them are talking and some of them aren't. <laughs> It was amazing. Uh, I, I I was blown away by that. I did not watch it when it first came out. I actually watched it only recently, and I kind of couldn't believe it. But but yeah, I mean, Bel- you know, Belichick's on the Manicast. He's on this thing with Manny where they do this like breaking down film thing. It's like yeah. a, I mean, it's really like in the in the kind of like football nerd um, space where it's lots of X's and O's and whatnot. Anyway, I just I'm keeping tabs on all of the different ways that. You can consume NFL content, all the different places you can consume it, all the sort of marginal Mm -hmm. things that are kind of swirling around it, like roasts on Netflix. Big dude perfect fan over here. (laughs) (laughs) Josh, what are you keeping tabs on? I'm keeping tabs on, this is less of a keeping tabs, more of a just like, I'm excited to tell everyone that Slow Horses is back for season four. great show. I love that show. It's one of my favorite TV shows. If you don't know, it's on Apple TV Plus, which I'm sure only five people are subscribed to. But it's a great show. It's really good. It's I If you love British spy thrillers, it's excellent. It's actually pronounced Slough Horses. Slough Houses. <laughs> Slough oh. Houses is the, is the name. But it's, a, it's an MI5 um, like spy thriller, but it's like very funny. And Gary Oldman is absolutely excellent in it. Jonathan Price is a, is a recurring guest star in it who's mm-hmm. an amazing British actor. It's Big just, Price fan. Yeah. Oh, I love Jonathan Price. Um, it's so good. Everyone should watch it. Yaz, what are you keeping tabs on? I have two. The first one, and I know this is annoying of me, but I have a feature out as of when this uh, podcast episode comes out. (laughs) It's about Weight Watchers. You should read it. It looks really good in print if you want to buy the print issue. Yeah. Um, But it'll be out online on Thursday. It's about where the company is, how it's reckoning with the Ozempic era, and what its future looks like. So I hope you all read that. You've been on this beat for a while. We talked about your Weight Watchers coverage last spring. I write the same story over and over again about Weight Watchers. That's what I do. Um, <laughs> it has evolved. It's evolved. <laughs> it's evolved. It's evolved. Yeah. Weight Watchers and wrestling. What can I say? Yeah, it's your um, beat. <laughs> my other keeping tabs is uh, the New York Times, a fantastic piece about the Red Lobster. And I found out that the nail in the coffin for Red Lobster was apparently its decision to offer unlimited shrimp every day, which meant that people would camp out in Red Lobsters for hours eating only shrimp and drinking water. <laughs> you could have set a time limit so on that. So funny. Well, they should know. I mean, shrimp is the one food that you can never get full eating. Like shrimp is like, is you know, it? like chips or something. Like you're not really going to get water full. water content food. Right. Yeah. Like you, you're going to get full of it. Yeah. Like you can eat a crazy amount of shrimp and not get and not get full. And they really should have done a little bit more research on that before. Yes. Well, its owner, which offer. was a Thai fish supplier, eventually was like, we can't do this anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's you and me, shrimp eat off. <laughs> <laughs> At Innovation <laughs> Festival. I, Come I, to Innovation Festival. Festival, everyone. A, 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 a Joey Chestnut, Yaz, and Josh just trying to eat oh, as many shrimp so as disgusting. they possibly Put us on the main stage. <laughs> <laughs> How is shrimp not part of the competitive eating circuit? It probably is, actually. And thank you it. for speaking Satya Dinell. Now we have <laughs> these two mid-tier <laughs> podcast hosts <laughs> eating shrimp. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Let's let's go to Bubba Gump Shrimp. <laughs> yeah. You can find us after uh, after Brendan's panel at Fast Company Innovation Festival with uh, with Lena Khan and Ted Sarandos at the Bubba Gump Shrimp <laughs> Times Square. That is a conversation I want to eavesdrop on. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be weird, but slide into our DMs if you're going to be at the festival. Yeah, we're all going to be at festival. Let us know uh, if you're going to be there and say hi. And that's it for Most Innovative Companies. Our show is produced by Avery Miles and Blake Odom. Editing by Julia Shu, mix and sound design by Nicholas Torres, and our executive producer is Josh Christensen. Remember again to subscribe, rate, and review, and we'll see you next week. 